Um, what is today? Today's Thursday. The dates are all mixed up. I think I covered all, I did cover all of this in this class. In mm -hmm. my next class, I didn't cover hardly any of it. Um, we talked about some of this, so I'm going to spend a few minutes. A few minutes will probably end up being an hour. I hate to say it. Um, on Tolkien's fairy story on essays. My goal for today, well, my goal ideally would be to get through the first half of Fellowship of the Ring. That ain't going to happen. Um, my real goal today is to get through this chapter. It's the second chapter. Okay? There are two main chapters, two key chapters, to not only Fellowship of the Ring, but to the entire Lord of the Rings. You don't get these two chapters, you're lost entirely. Okay? And in the films, the two key chapters are largely told via flashback. I mean, you get some of it in the films. Um, Council of Elrond, they totally butcher. And the Shadow of the Past, again, you get some of it, um, but it's not done. So let me, let me go to this for a few minutes. And the only reason I'm talking about Tolkien's on fairy stories, which again, remember, you're not required to read. I've given you a link for it under the content section of D2L. Um, but if you really want to understand Tolkien, you'll read it. I mean, it, it gives you the key to understanding. I, I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration. It is a bit of an exaggeration, but it's not too much to say, to understand everything Tolkien wrote. And by that I mean The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, the stories that become published in 1977 by Tolkien's son, I should have that up, as The Silmarillion, which are the mythology behind the mythology and history behind all of the Lord of the Rings, but even a lot of his scholarly stuff, like this essay, Beowulf, the Monsters and the Crypts. Okay? So, I mentioned the other day um, that Tolkien asserts, oh, not until at least halfway through this essay. And the published form of this essay is 90 pages long, including the notes, right? which are, I don't know, 15 or 20 pages. Um, and, re and remember, this thing was originally delivered orally as a lecture, okay? I imagine it had to be a bit hard to um, follow. Years and years and years ago, I got really interested in this, and so I started working on an edition of the essay, because it exists in, where is it? In this pub first published form in 1947, and then it was revised in about 1965 and republished in a book called The Tolkien Reader, which gives you the poems of Tom, ba the adventures of Tom Bombadil. This essay, a short story that he wrote to go along with this essay called Leaf by Niggle. It's kind of like a fictitious example of what he's saying in the essay. So he wrote the essay and he's like, I need to make this clear. And so he writes a short story that essentially does what the fairy story talks about, okay? Um, so I, I started working on this edition. I got access to Tolkien's manuscripts at the Bodleian Library, his, his literary estates lawyer granted me that. So I'm sitting there, I did this, I don't know, of a couple of years, I had two different trips to the Bodleian, and I'm looking at his manuscripts, you know, holding them and reading them and everything, and they're all written in pencil, and they're all faded. I mean, you're sitting there going, what in the world does this say kind of thing? And unbeknownst to me, a couple of other Tolkien scholars, um, as I'm literally finishing transcribing all of this material, they get the approval by the lawyer to do this edition. Okay. I told her what I was working on, but I hadn't submitted a formal proposal yet. So I ended up just sending them 
all of my transcription that I read. So in the published edition, I get this little, you know, thanks to Ted Sherman, <laughs> and, and as well as, you know, there's, a, I don't know, a couple dozen other people. So all that is to say what Tolkien says in, in this essay, halfway, two-thirds of the way through, is that fairy stories are not for children. And he actually begins the essay, see, this is why we're going to, I'm going to say too much. He actually begins the essay with three questions. Okay. I'll ask you one of the first questions. What's a fairy story? Don't give me an example. Tell me what one is. Define the term fairy story. If you were writing a paper and I asked you for the topic of your paper, tell me what a fairy story is. What would probably 90% of you do? First thing. Okay, I don't think 90% of you would do that. I think 10% of you would. Okay, I think 10% of you would do that. That's how many begin. You turn to what? A dictionary. Define your terms. Tolkien does the same thing. Okay, but he has three questions. One, what is a fairy story? Okay, that's one, that's the first question. Um, two, he asks, what are their origins? How did they begin? And then number three, What is their purpose now? Now. Okay, so give me an example of a fairy story. Tinkerbell is a character in possibly a fairy story. What fairy story is Tinkerbell in? Peter Pan. Is Peter Pan an old fairy story? No, less than 100 years. Yeah, I take that back. It's about 120 years old. Not even, yeah, about 110 or so. Okay? It's about 100 years old. Give me an example of an old fairy story. Snow White. Goes back to at least the 1600s. Probably earlier. Give me another one. You could just pull out all the old Disney films. Snow White, Cinderella. Sleeping Beauty, Rapunzel, okay. What is common to all of those? Well, the ones I just mentioned all have what? Women. A, woman, a woman character. A woman character usually is key. Therefore, does a fairy story require a key woman character? No, it doesn't. In fact, what Tolkien essentially says in his response to this question, what is a fairy story? He says it cannot be defined. He essentially says what oh, the U.S. Supreme Court Justice, and I always get confused which one, it's either Potter Stewart or Byron Wright, I think it's Potter Stewart, said when an issue of pornography, I think it was pornography, came before the Supreme Court. He said, I cannot define it, but I can tell you what it is when I see it. Okay? So, Tolkien essentially says the same thing. A fairy story or fairy stories cannot be defined. What literally does the word define mean? Think of the fine in define is related to the fine in the word infinite. Set a boundary. You set a boundary around it. You say it is only in this. It can't be this over here. Tolkien says. Now he may be wrong, but Tolkien believed you can't 
do that. Because almost as soon as you try to put a boundary around it, somebody's going to say, what about, we have to go, make that boundary a little bit bigger. When The Hobbit was first published, where is it? It was immediately hailed as a fairy story for children. What are, what, are what are some characteristics of fairy stories? This gets at the question of origins. What do fairy stories often have? Magic. Magic? What else? If they have magic, what else must they have? Magical users, frequently called magicians, okay, or Harry Potter, wizards, you know. What else? Louder? A great evil. A great evil? What else? Every story has a conflict. If you have a story without a conflict, you don't have a story. Why? You don't have life without conflict. Okay. What else? Creatures. Dogs, cats, guinea pigs, bunnies, hamsters. And magical creatures. Magical creatures. Or, or in other words, creatures that don't really exist, right? Like hobbits. Okay. Dwarves. And I don't mean people who suffer, you know, who have dwarfism. Okay. Dwarves. Ints. Tree beard. If you're familiar with the Harry Potter story, you know, in in the rolling elves, house elves, they need to remove the house elves. Okay, orcs. By the way, a lot of these words that are in Tolkien, like orcs and ints and stuff, they come from Old English. Orc comes from Orkneyus. Okay, int comes from Elton, or in Northern Germanic, Jotun. J-O-T-U-N, as in Jotunheim, if you're a Thor, you know, Marvel, where they really bastardize everything, okay? Jotunheim is the Heim home of the Jotuns, the giants and such, okay? So, those are getting an origins idea. So what are the origins? When did they first begin? Can we date it? No. How did they first begin? I kind of alluded to this the other day. To explain things, usually inexplicable things. How many of you ever, when you were a little kid, you were in your bedroom at night and you heard something, it was dark, and you didn't know what that something was, and you got chill bumps or you got afraid? What does the mind start to do? Yeah, if you're like me, yeah, it's, you know. I grew up in California in the 60s, literally less than 30 miles away from the Zodiac Killer. I remember going to sleep at night, literally afraid that this guy was going to break into our house. Okay? Turns out, didn't know it at the time. A few years later, let's see, in about 1980 or so, 1980, 82, it might have been even later than that. It was announced, discovered, um, a famous California serial murder was found, was captured, arrested. They found a whole bunch of bodies in some property that he owned in the Central Valley. His name was Leonard Lake. He lived four doors down from me. One of my sisters and I, one Halloween, I must have been, I don't know, eight or ten, you know, we'd gone trick-or-treating and stuff. And friends of ours used to live in the house. They moved away. He moved in a couple of years later or something like that. And he, you know, welcomed us, invited us into his house. And we were like, no, because we weren't stupid. We didn't go to anybody's house unless we knew the people. But the, the dead ringer was just dressed in all in black. And the living room, because you could see it when the door was open, was painted black. The whole thing. It's like... New, stay away from us, you know. And we left and started walking down the street and followed us for a little while. And it was only until, like, literally 10 years later that we found out about this guy. So, you know, evil monsters, are there monsters in fairy tales? Mm -hmm. 
aren't monsters kind of key to find monster? Jeffrey Dahmer. If you don't know who Jeffrey Dahmer is, look it up. D-A-H-M-E-R. Okay. Killed in eight people in Minnesota, I think it was. So, I mean, literally killed in eight people. Um, so, Tolkien says, you know, their origins are in the mists of time. What's another example of a fairy tale, but is a very literary fairy tale? That is, a lot of stories have been written based on this kind of fairy tale, or this fairy tale, and films have been made. There is still a belief among some people in England that this fairy tale character, one, is alive, it's just asleep, and two, will return. Return of the King, King Arthur. King Arthur. But it could be that even the King Arthur myth, fairy tale, is based on an earlier, depending upon one's belief system, fairy tale. Who do righteous, and if you're Jewish, correct me if I'm wrong, who do righteous Orthodox Jews still look to come? The Messiah. The Messiah. Christians say Jesus is the Messiah. Jews don't. They still, he's, he's going to come. Who's the Messiah? The King. The King of Kings. One of the reasons they say Jesus wasn't the Messiah is you know, he got killed. It doesn't happen to the Messiah. The Messiah is going to come and reign. He's going to put down all of the earthly power, blah, 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 blah. Right? Tolkien just takes that notion of the missing king and says, hmm, how can I? Okay. So you've got in this all of these elements. Tolkien calls them essentially the ingredients of soup. And he uses the metaphor of what he calls the cauldron of story. Think of a cauldron. Big old cauldron. Or, you know, Eight quart, you know, baking uh, pan, whatever. And he says, what happens with stories over time is stuff gets thrown in. Okay? And then you turn the heat up a little bit and you let it simmer and cook. King Arthur is cooked for a long time in the cauldron of story. What else is in that cauldron of story that Tolkien uses and J.K. Rowling uses? J.K. Rowling doesn't use it in this form. Magic item. Keep going. Think Tolkien and Rowling together. A magic item that what? More powerful than I am. Close. I don't think that's the same as a... Kind of. What does the ring do? Makes you invisible. And Harry has an invisibility cloak. But so do a couple other people within the novels, which kind of muddies the water, makes mm, some problems. Tolkien, oh, my bias here, you may disagree. You're wrong, but you can disagree. <laughs> Tolkien is a much better writer than J.K. Rowling is. I'd probably rather sit around a campfire with a couple beers with J.K. Rowling than I would with Tolkien because he would never finish his damn story. <laughs> Rowling would probably tell you a really good story over the course of an hour. Because she's not concerned with all the little pesky details. Tolkien is. He's got to have every one of those little pesky details tightly wound back into the story. That's why it takes him 14 years. Mm -hmm. 18, 16 years, okay, to finish it, all right? 
So, what are they? What are their origins? Can't answer that? Doesn't matter, he essentially says, about the origins. And when he's talking about the origins, he's getting back to an idea he dealt with here. The, those critics that he's talking about read Beowulf to discover the origins of certain characteristics and behaviors of the Germanic people. Rather than, man, this is a really good story that is very perfectly balanced. You have the rise of a hero named Beowulf and the fall of a hero named Beowulf. And the hero has to confront three monsters. The critics prior to Tolkien said those monsters are extraneous. They're peripheral to the poem. They're not important. Tolkien said, we're not reading the same poem. The monster, Without the monsters, without Grendel, Grendel's mother, and the dragon, you have no story of Beowulf. That's like talking about the Iliad by Homer and removing Achilles and Hector. You, you don't have the Iliad or the Odyssey in removing Odysseus, Ulysses. You don't have the Odyssey, which we now take that proper name, Odysseus, and it becomes a noun. What is an Odyssey? It is a long, drawn-out journey. Okay? Why? Because it took Odysseus a long, drawn-out journey to get home from the time when he first left for the Trojan War. It took him 20 years. It took him 10 years after the war was over. Why? Because he pissed off Poseidon. That's it. Angered Poseidon. Well, okay, so he blinded his son. You know, little, little things. Um, so, Tolkien says, their origins don't really matter. Moreover, he says what critics have done and what we do when we talk about the origins of fairy stories is we destroy what is there. People do the exact same thing with this. And everything else Tolkien's written. In The Hobbit, you've got a whole bunch of dwarves named. Ori, Nori, Dori, Oin, Glowin, Bifur, Bofur, Bomber, Thorin, uh, Balin, Dwalin, Filly Killy, okay? And then you also have, you know, the wizard, Gandalf. Almost every one of those names comes from an old Norse poem. Tolkien, because he is so well read, and knew the, um, and drawing a blank on it, Drew knew the old Norse poem intimately. He just has those names floating around in his mind. His mind is like that cauldron of story. It's just got all kinds of stuff because he was so well read. He read the Iliad and the Odyssey in Homeric Greek. He read the Aeneid in Virgilian Latin. He read the Kalevala, the Finnish national epic, which wasn't put into literary written form until the 19th century. He read that and he knew it front and back. All of that gets entered in and influences this. And he says, if you try to understand this by looking at the source material, what do you end up with? Go back to that notion of the soup of story. How do you make a soup? You put a bunch of different ingredients in what? In a pot with what? Water. You gotta have the water, otherwise you just end up with mush, okay? And then what do you do? You let it cook and sit. So, today's Thursday, Tuesday morning, I'm gonna make breakfast for you. So don't worry about eating, and you come in. I'm not literally, but this is my analogy. So you come in Tuesday morning, you expect to have breakfast. 
and you find the table here, and there's, you know, there's about 20 or so people. So there's three dozen eggs in the curtain. And there's a couple of slabs, a couple of pounds of raw bacon. And there's a bag of coffee and a big pitcher of water, and I don't know, maybe some oranges. Dig in. What's going to go through your mind? Yeah, idiot, those are ingredients. That's not breakfast. Make it for me. You look at the source, and all you got is the ingredients. For a soup, you got to mix the stuff together. It's got to have spices and herbs so that it all intertwines. Origins, unimportant. Here's the important question. What is their purpose? Notice, now he asks. So he tells the students in that audience, students and faculty, these three questions right off the bat. And he says, okay, so we're going to deal with the first one first. And he does immediately what I said probably many of you would do. He goes to the OED to answer the first one. And he says, well, it's useless. And ultimately, we can't answer it. What about this one? And he talks about sources and mythology and all that kind of stuff. And says, not really useful. So let's talk about this one. And what he does when he gets to finally addressing this question, he modifies it slightly. He says, what are the uses and functions of fairy stories now? He's delivering this verbally in 1939. Now, in 1939, this is March of 1939, what happens, for those of you who know, on September 1st of 1939? World War II. Hitler rolls into Poland. The Anschluss, the taking over of Czechoslovakia, has already, in Austria, has already occurred. Okay. Now, why do we read fairy stories now? Now, his audience, largely undergraduate, but again, also faculty, maybe some graduate students, in 1939, St. Andrews, Scotland. St. Andrews, the premier university of Scotland, the oldest university of Scotland. They know, you know, they're giving a lecture about fairy stories. But they're probably thinking, what? What do you mean now? I mean, we read fairy stories as an academic discipline. I mean, that's kind of how Andrew Lang approached them. And so Tolkien begins this section by talking about children. Why? Because we think they're for children. And Tolkien essentially says... That is merely an accident of history. He says fairy stories ended up being relegated to children the same way you guys are all too young. You don't, you know. 40 years from now when you're old, and if you have children, most of your children will be grown up. So let me back up. 20 years from now, when some of you might have young children, and you've had furniture in your house that you've had for 10 or 20 years, what often happens to that Older, slightly used furniture. You get rid of it. It gets broken. You get rid of it. Or, as cheap people do, you put it upstairs in the bonus room. Why? Because the kids are going to jump all over it anyways. If it's downstairs, why not put it upstairs and let them jump on it or sleep? Tolkien says that furniture gets relegated. Terminology he uses is the nursery. Why? Because the adults no longer want it. They want the nice new furniture downstairs to entertain their guests, guests with. Because, you know, children are to be neither seen nor heard, really. You know, ship them off to the upstairs room. So he says, we did the same thing with fairy stories. When? Beginning in the 19th century. See, when Jacob and William... And his brother, Wilhelm Grimm, started collecting fairy stories. 
they weren't doing that for children. And that was in the early 1800s. They weren't doing that for children. They were doing that for adults. You know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, or um, Glass Slipper, Cinderella. Cinderella. That wasn't meant originally for kids. Especially when you get to Disney-fied abominations out of your mind. I, I'm kidding, you know. They're great films, but they're not what the earlier forms of the stories are. Because what do some of the women in Cinderella do to try to marry the charming prince? They cut off their toes, they shim off their ankle, their heels, because they're going to get their foot in that damn slipper. I mean, think about it. The prince, the castle, the whole nine yards versus drudgery, okay? So Tolkien says they're not for children for a couple of reasons. What do children naturally have that we don't? Imagination. They live kind of, depending upon the age, and bear in mind, it's a lot easier for Tolkien to say this in 1939 than it is in 2022. Why? We've destroyed childhood. More so in the last five years, you know, I've been teaching this for close to 30 years, than in the previous 25 years. Because now five-year-olds are being taught in schools things that five-year-olds should never, my opinion, you may disagree, hear about. We are destroying child. And a guy even wrote a book in the 1980s called The End of... Oh, it's not The End of Innocence end of childhood, about how in the 1980s this was already going on. Okay, But Tolkien says children have this natural sense of wonder. I used the, the image the other day of kicking a little kid for a walk and the kid will pick up something off the ground and go, oh, this is wonderful. And, you know, like me. It's trash. Put it down. You don't know where it's been, whose hands it's been in, what, etc. Why? It's new. It's shiny, you know, okay? We, me, you guys probably still have maybe still a little bit of this wonder. I've been around the world too much to, you know, really have much. It takes a really beautiful sunrise or sunset or something like that, you know, to still awaken us. Growing up in California, I never saw a tornado, okay? Always wanted to. Never saw a UFO. Part of me always wanted to, you know. Earthquakes, not a problem. You know, I could be standing here in class, and this thing could start going like this, and I'd probably, you know, do this, and you guys would freak out, and I'd come on, it's just a little earthquake. Usually, you know, I'd be sitting there, and I'd suddenly feel sick to my stomach, and then I'd look around, and I'd look for something hanging on a wall, and if it's doing this, I go, oh yeah, that's an earthquake. Usually, that's a little one. Big ones, I go out and look at the pool, in an above ground pool, and the water would be sloshing over the sides. I'd be like, ooh, that's a, that's a 5.6 or so. You can usually tell by the size. Okay? Mentioned tornadoes. Always wanted to see one. Got my chance. 2009. Two of them. One week apart. The big one that hit Murfreesboro, and the smaller one. It hit Murfreesboro the week before that. We were in church Saturday night. I'm Orthodox. We have Saturday night Vespers services. And this stupid little F.O. Strength her, uh, tornado comes right where we're having our church service. This old storefront kind of thing. Blew out all the windows in the cars that were there. Collapsed the back of the building and such. And I was like, okay, cool. Never need to see one again. And the following week was Good Friday, right? I'm getting ready to go for a you know, massage or acupuncture or something, and I'm looking left to turn on Highway 96, and I know there's storms in there. There's been all kinds of thunderstorm warnings and stuff. And all these cars are pulling to the right real quickly. I figure there's got to be emergency vehicles coming. I turn and look to the right, and literally about 300 yards away from me, this big, giant black V coming right at me. 
I just jam my car in reverse, back up 200 yards to my house, tell my kids to get under the stairs, and being the damn fool I am, I go out on the front porch, you know, to do this, and see it, you know, float, it's not on the ground, hit the house at the end of the street, and part of the roof just goes, whoof, and then it skips again, and that's when it starts all of its damage. So that kind of wonder, I don't need anymore. I am, I am you know, fat, dumb, and happy now. Okay? So purpose is where Tolkien says they're meant for us. Why? Because we adults describe your everyday life day in, day out. Get up, you eat, maybe you go to work, go to school, class, you eat, you go to bed. There might be some entertainment, you know, diversionary stuff thrown in. And then what? And you get up and you do it again. What phrase was coined, I think in the 1960s, to describe this? The rat race. We are nothing like little rats in a giant psychology experiment. And the little bit of cheese we've been put at the end of the maze. And the maze, that's our daily life. And then you die. Kind of cheery, right? Well, Tolkien's like, that's why we need fairy stories. Because they give us these four things. Fantasy. Which he partially defines as arresting strangeness. Arresting means it stops you in your tracks. See, that tornado kind of did that for me. I mean, the big one stopped me in my tracks for two seconds, and then I thought, if I don't leave, I'm dead. Okay? What else? You know, give me an example. What would be a good example of this? In reality, I'm not talking fairy stories. If it were to really happen, I'm suggesting it has What would something that would just stop you dead? Not dead, but you know, frozen, catatonic. If Jesus returned, it would, you know, that would stop a lot of people, depending upon your, you know, views of revelation and or what's called eschatology, the study of the end times. You know, there are groups that say, you know. Jesus returned, all the Christians are going to go up to heaven, and everybody else, man, you're totally screwed. If you're on a plane, and the pilot's a Christian, and the co-pilot's a Christian, you're dead. Because that plane's going down. Um, what else? How many of you have seen Arrival? With Amy Adams and Jer uh, Jeremy Renner, okay? Or contact with Jodie Foster. Or pick your alien movie, Signs, which I'll make references to Signs, you know, in this class a couple of times. What if, or Independence Day, let me just use that one. What if today, okay? Some of you have computers open. Let's just assume for a moment that you have something open other than note-taking software. And I don't know, you pick your website or whatever. That might every now and then have like a little news feed. Well, I bet, bet even if you didn't, all of you have probably one of these. Imagine for a moment that, you know, in two minutes, suddenly, big massive UFO appears over Washington, D.C., why did I refer to this? What's, we're going to get a presidential notification by the Federal Emergency Management Association probably, uh, agency. Probably, what is it going to say? They'll probably tell everyone to shelter in place. Shelter in place or, depending upon your religion, pray to Jesus, pray to Muhammad, pray to him, whatever. Or... Stick your head between your legs and <laughs> kiss your, you know what, goodbye, because we're not in Kansas anymore. What would that be? First contact, you know, so to speak. Well, a lot of people have said, oh, 
huh, I've seen them. I've got a colleague here who teach, used to teach stuff on UFOs and stuff. If I remember right, you know, she said something about being abducted. I have no idea whether that's true or false. Congress, this was this just hit the news two days ago. Congress, in one of its authorization bills, it's currently going through Congress, has a two-sentence passage. And this is dealing with the Pentagon and what are called now unidentified aerial phenomena, the UAP program, what we just used to call UFOs. Well, they've got a statement in there that they want the Pentagon to differentiate between, and it's now no longer just unidentified aerial phenomena, it's now unidentified transmedium phenomena. Why? Because some videos were released a couple of years ago from the USS Forrester or something like that that showed these unidentified things hovering, flying really fast speeds, making turns that cannot be made according to modern physics, and then going in the water, in the ocean, and disappearing. You know, and then the Navy goes and looks for it, and there's no debris, so it goes from air to water. And there's also been recordings, according to some people who've leaked this, of subs tracking things underwater going something like 60, 75 miles an hour. There's nothing other than you know, torpedoes <laughs> that do that. Okay? So, there's a statement in there. We want you to discriminate between known human origin, these things, and known not human origin. So over on this side, those things produced by Russia, China, maybe North Korea, maybe Iran, you know, and those from John Williams Star Wars music, you know, a long time ago in the galaxy far from, that kind of thing. It's the first time any branch of government, anywhere, anytime, has asserted that some of these things are not from around here. But it's not big major news. Why? Where's the evidence? Show it to us, kind of thing, all right? That would be arresting strangeness, right? If I were to open this blind and all of a sudden you saw sitting on top of all of these oak trees, this big old massive UFO, what would you do? Hide? Really? What good is hiding going to do? I mean, let's be honest. Yeah, we're in the middle of a building. Yeah, we're in the middle of a square of a building, but if that sucker can arrive there in, without any forewarning, unless they're totally nice, you know, Smurfs, um, we're screwed, okay? So, arresting strangeness. And Tolkien in there, mentions that literary fantasy that we're talking about involves a secondary world. What does he mean? He means the author creates a world, think of your head, your brain, as a hard drive. Okay? And what does it do? The author says, I'm going to take a little bit of your brain and I'm going to reformat it. I'm going to use it to make the secondary world. And when you're inside there, that is, when you're really into the story, everything inside there feels and seems what? Real. Totally real. Have you ever gotten so engrossed, so lost in a story that somebody's talking to you and you, know, you don't hear them? That's what he's talking about. And he says, it's got to follow its own rules. That is, there have to be rules and laws for this creation. Now, one of the reasons Tolkien says this is because he's working on the stories for this. He's creating this whole other world. Right? 
He didn't like, for example, when his good friend C.S. Lewis wrote Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. Tolkien had a real problem with that. Why? Because these English kids discover themselves in another world called Narnia, which is totally cool, you know. You've got fawns. You've got talking horses and bears and mice and such. And who do they meet up with relatively early? Santa Claus. Father Christmas. This is another world. What the hell is Father Christmas doing in Narnia? What do you have to get before you get Father Christmas? Christmas. <laughs> Jesus has got to come in the flesh. Doesn't happen in Narnia. So what's he doing there? He's like, no, Jack, you can't do this. Nickname for C.S. Lewis. You can't do this. You're bringing in stuff that is external. Problem is, at that point, Lewis hadn't yet written The Magician's Nephew, which is how we find out you know, the origins of Narnia and how humans get there and all that kind of stuff. There, there is a rational kind of explanation for it. Okay? So that's the secondary world idea. What's the secondary world in J.K. Rowling? Hogwarts. The whole magical world. Okay. What about number four, Privet Drive? No, that's as boringly real as it can be. I mean, that is... Hmm. Okay, so, after all of that, he says, fairy stories offer us... I knew it. Wait, recovery. Recovery. Recovery implies what? Something was lost or something was wrong or something was bad. If you're in recovery, that means what? Yeah. I mean, it might be you're in recovery, you know, I need replacement. I was in recovery for a few months. Still am. Will be for a couple of years, actually. Or usually it's more implied you were an addict or you were an alcoholic and you're in recovery means you're going back to the state kind of before that. But he's not talking about addiction. He's talking about how we perceive the world, how we see the world. He says it's seeing as we were meant to see. Okay? And what he ultimately gets at in that point is how we see those we love. Okay? I think I mentioned in here, been married for 37 years, 36, 38, something like that. What years? It's 20, 22, 30, yeah, 37 years. I don't see my wife today the way I did when we got engaged, or the way when I first met her, or the way even when I first saw her. Because I literally, when I first saw her, I thought, I'm going to marry her. She, you know, like C.S. Lewis dragged into Christianity, I mean, kicking and screaming, believe me. It was a hard-won fight, but I beat her down eventually. What does Tolkien mean? What do we tend to do with the people that we love the most? How do we tend to treat them? Not the best. No. I usually keep this, my wallet, in my back pocket. That's how we tend to treat those we love the most. Why, what, what does this mean? It's close, right? And I'm in control. I know where it is all the time. Do I literally know where my wife is all the time? No. Nope. Pretty good idea. She's work, you know, kind of thing. But what Tolkien says is with our familiars, those people that we see the most, etc., we take them for granted. What does the for granted mean? She's been there for 37 years. She'll be there tomorrow. And the next day. And the next day. And I can walk all the way closer to you. Or I've been here for 37 years. And I'll be here tomorrow. Well, there were 32 kids at Virginia Tech 
in 2007 that their parents thought they would be there, or there were 3,000 people on September 11, 2001 that their loved ones thought would always be there, and they will never be there after that day. Okay? Sorry to be you know. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what the next five minutes holds. All right? Tolkien says we should see those familiars, and he extrapolates, and everything else around us is new, as though we'd never seen it slash them before. Go on YouTube and search for um, something like blind person receives sight or deaf person receives hearing. You can have the hardest, stoniest heart in the world. And some of those videos will reduce you to nothing but a puddle of tears. There's this one, and I'll probably tear up just talking about it. And it's a wife and a husband. And I want to say it's the wife who has been blind, blind from birth. Has surgery. I don't remember what they replaced. They replaced something. And, you know, has the bandages taken off her eyes. And it's not like she sees her husband in perfect 3D, you know, 4K color, you know, all that kind of stuff. But she sees the outline of him in just tears. Or somebody who's never heard the voice of their loved one. There's one of a little kid. Oh, I mean, it's like, just cut your heart out, okay? That's what Tolkien's talking about. That's how he thinks we are meant to see each other, even if you don't know each other. Why? As Harry, as the narrator says, Harry should think in book seven, after a key major event, okay, Harry should realize that just to be alive is a totally miraculous, amazing thing. Similarly, just for this person or this person or to be here, walking in miracle. That's why Tolkien would suggest we should never take anyone for granted. Look at the history, if you want. Primarily of single young male shooters. What are a couple things they all have in common? One, and it's the most prevalent, lack of fathers. Two, it's the second most prevalent. No, they're messed up in the head. Okay, they are messed up in the head. Abuse or bullying. Abuse or bullying, and what often comes, what is part of abuse and bullying, they don't fit in. And it's not necessarily because they're messed up in it. It's, they're ignored. They're not seen. They're invisible. You know how to become not invisible? Make yourself seen. The two guys in the Columbine, killing they wanted to make sure everybody knew they lived. A central tenet of the, the philosophical beliefs of, belief of existentialism is you've got to validate your existence. That is, you've got to make your own meaning in life. Right? Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus essentially said, it doesn't matter how you do that. You could be Mother Teresa helping the untouchables in Calcutta. Selfless, right? Totally selfless act. Or you could be Adolf Hitler. Guess what? People will be talking about Mother Teresa for 500 years, just as we'll be talking about Hitler for 500 years. That's why a lot of news organizations, when there is a mass shooting, they say, we will not name this person. Why? Because that's what they wanted. 
We're not going to make them fans. So, seeing as we are meant to see, seeing everything, seeing every tree, every flower, as wow, full of glory, so to speak. Okay? Escape. How many of you like to escape? Somebody who was in one of my classes was wearing one of the t-shirts with the escape game. You know, you go to the escape room about why? Okay, it's understandable. Why do we need escape and children don't? Little children. We have no imagination. Okay, that's the rote answer. Thank you. Okay. We're so wrapped up in everyday life. It's the rat race. Who doesn't want to escape? How many of you just wake up beaming for the day to begin? Yeah, looks on your faces tell me, what have you been smoking, man? No. It's more like, oh, no, nothing. Got to go listen to an hour and a half for that person to drone on and on. Be glad you're not in my, I don't have any this semester, my three-hour classes, which I don't take a break in. It's straight three hours. I say, doors open, you need to use a restroom, go suck on a cancer stick, you know. You're not supposed to, MTSU, tobacco-free, many states can Whatever. But come back in and I just I just keep going. Okay. We need escape from everyday life. What kinds of things do we need escape from? You need escape from your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your significant other? Sometimes. What else? What do we really kind of want to escape from? Our reality. Bills, our reality. We hit, you look at it in the news. What, according to some people, is the number one threat facing the United States right now? Is it Russia? No. Is it China? No. Is it North Korea? No. What is it? It's us. It's us. <laughs> Climate change. The Secretary of Defense has said it's climate change. Is climate change going to kill you tomorrow? Today? Ten years? No. We were told, well, I'm old enough to remember back when climate change was about the coming ice age. Okay? But Al Gore said, whenever he did the inconvenient truth, why, <laughs> my opinion, you know, that there would be no Arctic ice caps by 2012. There's more Arctic ice today than there has been in like the last 20 or 30 years. So what else do we have to escape from? You know, I mentioned I had knee replacement surgery. It still hurts. Pain. Hunger. Poverty. If you're in Ukraine, war. Racism. Prejudice. Pick your evil. How many of us don't want to escape from those things? How many of us want a world where there's more prejudice and more racism? Yeah. No. Nobody wants that. How about more hunger? More cancer? I can't tell you the number of students I've had. My first semester, young, 20 years old, knocked out, gorgeous. Student comes up to me in my office one day after class. It's her 21st birthday. Diagnosed with uterine cancer that day. You know, and we're being told, don't ever touch a student. Don't ever put your arms around. And I'm like, to hell with that. I gave her a big, long hug that lasted for like 10, because she was just sobbing. I had another student, same semester, <laughs> come in, you know, Dr. Sherman, I'm pregnant and I'm thinking of getting an abortion. I'm like, the hell are you telling me this, you know? Sat her down and talked to her about it. I think she ended up not getting the abortion. She ended up getting out, going out of school, becoming a mother, the whole thing. Okay? Yeah, we want to escape from problems. What's the greatest thing we want to escape from? Think big term. You're close, because this takes us out of reality. Death. We, our society, spends Billions of dollars, eh, probably more than that, to try to escape death. Whether literally or figuratively, 
What is a figurative way we try to escape death? Pick any actor over the age, well, almost any actor, over the age of 50. I don't know what's going on with Tom Cruise, man. There's, there's, that guy's got the weirdest genes, I guess. Because I swear, he does not look much older than he did, you know, when he did the first Top Gun. But most other actors. Sandra Bullock, for example. Used to be drop-dead gorgeous, cute, etc. Saw a movie that she did like a year ago. I think it went straight to DVD. And you can just tell her face is plastic. It's like they took a picture of her from 20 years ago and said, make me look like this again. It doesn't work. Look at Meg Ryan. <clears throat> just sorry. I mean, the, it's not working. What is a smaller extension of that? And I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not picking on any sex or anything like that. Makeup. Makeup. Clothing. It has nothing to do with extending our life, but it has everything to do with what? How we appear to others. Okay? But Tolkien says the greatest escape is death. That's why we have tales of immortality. We don't. People are afraid. I have a, I have a um, family relative. When my mom died, she died of Alzheimer's. My dad died of Alzheimer's and a brain tumor. So when we get to Harry Potter and we talk about a couple of characters, I'm probably my voice is going to crack because it's still kind of raw. When my mom died, um, we're Orthodox, and that usually means you have an open casket funeral. And I built the coffin for her, you know. But this person, she's like, nope. Don't want to see her. And she didn't look any different than she did the day before. Just dead. Like, nope, not me. You know, and some of the other members of him, nope, uh, don't like dead people. Why? I'll tell you why. Because that's where you're going to be. It's a fear. It's an inordinate fear. Yes. Is there anything to be said about the fact that a lot of the immortality stories, the immortality ends up being more of a curse. Yes, there's an awful lot to that. Mm -hmm. you know? Not all of them, many of them. The person who is immortal who, or who becomes immortal in some way wants to die. They're not like the Energizer Bunny where they just keep on going. They're like somebody who is tired of seeing spouses, children, grandchildren, go on, dying, and still going on. I mean, I think of how worn out my body is at 60. You know, I think of somebody, depending on what your belief is, you know, about the, the Bible and stuff, you know, go back to the book of Genesis. Methuselah, 969 years. Abraham didn't have any kids till he was over 100. And I'm like, really? I had my youngest, my wife had my youngest, when I was, I don't remember, uh, 39. I'm thinking, dude, unless you had a lot better, you know, vitality than I do, that's got to be really hard, okay? So, the greatest escape is of death. And Tolkien uses this example to talk about it. See, we're not even going to get to fellowship. Um, what's the example? Because Tolkien says most critics at the time that he's writing this, and the same thing holds today, if you were to tell somebody, usually somebody a little bit older, you, oh yeah, I've got this class. Notice I don't put that adjective great in front of me. You just have this class. Where you're reading the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter novels. I can almost guarantee you, one of the first questions you're going to get is, and that's college level? Wait, you're getting credit for that? I've had students that I've taken to England, you know, talk to some English folks, and they go, you flew over from the United, to take, the United States to take a course for a month in London on Harry Potter, and they give you university credit for that? Gee, that's not all. Oxford. <laughs> they actually do, of course, it's at Oxford. Um, why? Because it's kitty lit, man. 
It's children's art. That's that stuff little kids do to wild. That's not serious. I mean, you ought to be reading Hemingway and Faulkner and pick some other boring writer. You know, I've had courses in Hemingway and Faulkner, etc. So Tolkien to describe the idea of escape, he says it's the difference between the flight of the prisoner and the flight of the deserter. Well, let's look at this one first. Deserter. You, let's say you're in the military, you have a set position, you have a job to do, and you say, mm, I don't want to do it anymore. And you leave. Maybe you're on guard duty. You know, you're walking the perimeter. And you just leave. You are what's called a deserter. You are a wall, absent without leave. Now, maybe you just left your post because you had to go take a leak or something. Not usually. Usually it's something more important for you to be called a deserter. To be a deserter, or if you are a deserter, what if you're caught, what does that usually involve? Yeah, yeah often, especially if it's any time of war. Okay. Why? Because you agreed to that job. Especially in the United States, all voluntary military. If you're Israeli, you didn't agree to it. You're automatically, you serve two years. You might get to choose which branch of the military, but you're serving. You know, Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot, two years. Okay? All Israelis. There, there are no, you know, ooh, I've got a bones for deferment kind of in the heads. You know. So that kind of thing versus this thing. Say you're a POW in war. It used to be. World War II, what was required of every POW by the United States? You're a United States member of the Army, and you've been captured by the Germans. What are you supposed to attempt to do? Escape. Escape. Why? Because that's not where you belong. Huge difference between wanting to escape from a prison and wanting to escape from your responsibilities. Now, in this analogy, what does that make this world? Prison. And an awful lot of writers, going back thousands of years, has described this life as like a prison. And all you need to do is get free of this life. You know? Yoda says in one of the star, second Star Wars films, to, oh, almost said Frodo, to um, Luke, he says, you know, we are not just this material stuff. We are celestial beings. In other words, this stuff is holding us down. That is, by the way, what is called Gnosticism. And it has, you know, little wrinkles of Manichaeism. Gnostic simply meaning of the mind and of the spirit is what's most important. Both of these are, within the Christian tradition, heresies. Why? Opening chapters of Genesis. What is said after each day? And it was good. Well, what's made in each of those days? Physical, material stuff. There's nothing bad about it. Okay? So, escape. We want to escape from these things. Tolkien says, fairy stories do this for us. I can't tell you how many times. And if it's not even reading fairy stories. It's just reading, you know, spy novels and stuff like that. My wife will be reading something, and I'll say, Karen. And I could stand there for five minutes and say, Karen, Karen, Karen. And she's so engrossed in that book. She's escaping me at that point, okay? Eh? Last point, consolation. Tolkien says every real true fairy story provides for its adult readers consolation. What is consolation? What's a consolation prize? It makes you feel better because you're a loser. <laughs> That's what a consolation prize is. It's like a participation trophy in children's sports. Oh, good job. You guys lost 30 to 0, but you still participated, right? 
So what does he mean by the consolation? And he talked about the consolation of the happy ending. It's not a happy ending in the sense that, and they all lived happily ever after. It's not the Disneyfied happy ending. If you've read or even seen the Lord of the Rings films, how is it not that kind of happy ending? Yeah, people still die. Frodo is unable to ever live in Middle Earth again. He's so changed. As he puts it, wounded in soul and body. Okay. And even Harry. Don't think the curse of the book she never should have written, the curse of child or whatever it's called. The stupid god awful play in book version. Um the happy ending is an ending that includes joy, but it doesn't deny the real world. So Tolkien had to create a term for that. He calls it the U catastrophe. Everybody in here knows what a catastrophe is, right? Catastrophe. Yeah. Okay. The word strophe there means turn. Comes from ancient Greek. In ancient Greek plays, you had a group called the Chorus. And the Chorus's purpose in the play was to kind of comment on the previous action in the play. And so you would have the strophe, where the Chorus, a group of men, would walk from one side of the stage and talk to the other side of the stage. And then you would get the anti-strophe, where they would walk back to the other side of the stage and talk. So what is a kata? Strophe. Strophe meaning turn. Kata, like in catatonic. Frozen. Or sudden. You don't go to, into a catatonic state slowly. It happens very, very quickly, like as a result of a stroke or a heart attack. Okay? So it is a sudden turn. That's all the word catastrophe means. I don't know if any of you play the lotto, but think of the person, I think it was one, who won the Powerball lottery a couple weeks ago. It was like, what, 1.38 billion? That is a catastrophe. Why? Well, you don't think that person's life suddenly changed? Like overnight, realizing I'm a poor schlub? No, I'm a billionaire. Well, not really, because about a third of that was taken by the government. You know, I think they were supposed to end up with like 750, 760 million. Jump change. So that's a sudden turn. Now you can have a disc catastrophe. 9/11. Bad sudden turn, or you can have a U catastrophe. U Greek means good or beautiful. Think of it this way you're in love with someone, and you think that other person loves you. And I'm an old fashioned traditionalist, so I'm going to be entirely sexist. It's me and my wife, before we were married. Let's say we had never dis even discussed the idea of marriage. And one evening we're out on a date, and I pull out a ring, and I pop the question. At that point, am I in a discatastrophe or a catastrophe? I'm on the knife edge between. Because the response is everything. What? Are you crazy? No. This catastrophe. Oh, you know. Yes, of course. You catastrophe. Notice, there's no in between there. <laughs> One of the two things is going to happen. If I never brought the ring out, there wouldn't be any turn at all. It'd just be plodding on along. In which case, I need escape and probably recovery because I'm not seeing her the way I see her. You know, kind of a thing. 
So, the Eucatastrophe, Tolkien calls it a sudden and miraculous grace never to be counted on to recur. It's the sudden turn that you can never expect to happen again. Where's that happen in the third Star Wars film? For those of you who have seen it. Louder. Order 66. Yeah. Which Order 66? Are, are all the original trilogy. I mean the original trilogy. Yeah. Sorry. Where Darth Vader. Where Darth Vader throws the Emperor. Are there little kind of smaller? You could, yes, there are. There's all, all throughout the Star Wars films. And even all throughout the War of the Rings, you've got little catastrophes and you've got big major ones. I'll probably spend way too long talking about this little tiny one involving Gandalf and the character Theta, which is totally blown out of proportion and such in the film. But notice, it's a grace, but it's a turn that you can't expect and it can't happen again. Can Darth Vader somehow destroy the Emperor again? No. Can the ring be destroyed twice? No. Once it's done, it's done. Okay? It's, Tolkien says, a sudden joyful turn. In fact, he says, when it happens, it makes you go, <gasps> it's a stopping of the heart. And he describes it as a sudden glimpse of joy beyond the confines of this world. Now, that is loaded theological language. Why? What does it first of all assume? It assumes something that Philip Pullman, the author of the, his Dark Materials series, Golden Compass, okay, and Subtle Knife and whatever, the, the Amber Spyglass, Denies. He says, is not real. It assumes that what we see is not all there is. It assumes there is something beyond this world. And I don't mean Mars, Jupiter, Venus. I mean beyond the visible realm. J.K. Rowling is going to do the same kind of thing. Which is why I argue... All the Christians who want to burn her at the stake and burn all her books need to shut up and read the damn books. Okay? I once had this student, graduate student, her husband was a minister. My father was a preacher. I founded a church in, in not at MTSU, in Murfreesboro, go, you know, hold my hand. And she was like, Dr. Sherman, how in the world can you teach those books or let your children read those books? And I can't remember her name, but I was like, you haven't read them, right? She was like, no. And I said, read them first. Read them, then ask me that question. Okay? Because they're not about what that branch of the Christian community says they're about. Okay? They're not about, ooh, dark magic and drawing children to Satan in witchcraft. <laughs> um, so, Joy beyond the confines of this world. What's he, what is he talking about? Unspeakable joy that cannot be expressed, which comes from where? Heaven. It's it. It's clear that's what he means. Because the other place is what? And you don't get joy from there. It's pain. It's a glimpse of what we are, he would say, meant for. And in the published version, here, he has an epilogue. I've never found out. There's not an account. And his delivery typescript, that is, the, the version of the essay that he actually read and delivered to the students at St. Andrews, doesn't survive. But the first published version in 1937 has an epilogue. And in the epilogue, Tolkien connects. Everything he's 
talking about with fairy stories to what he calls the fairy story, Christianity, which he says the greatest fairy story there ever was. Why? Because if there was something that was mythologically kind of oriented that we would really wish to be true, it's this. God, creator of everything, sees the problems humanity has created and says, I'll take care of it. You know, blows the mind, all right? Um, by the way, it's the way he convinced his friend, C.S. Lewis, to become a Christian. C.S. Lewis, who was a card, I mean, almost literally, card-carrying atheist. He would get into arguments with Christians just to beat them down, you know, stupid morons. How unrational can you be? And Tolkien essentially said, he and another guy went, with, went for a walk with Lewis late one evening. And he said, Jack, you love mythology, right? He said, oh, yeah. He said, well, think of Christianity as this way. A myth. But it's true. He was like, wait, wait, wait. think about it. It's got all the elements. It's got the dying God. It's got the resurrection. It's got blah, 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 blah. And it was like the next morning, Lewis wasn't a Christian. But he was getting there. And he talks about it in his little kind of autobiography. He took a ride with his brother. They went to a zoo. He got in the sidecar of his brother's motorcycle. And he said, when I left for the zoo, I was just a theist. That is, God's out there somewhere. By the time he arrived, he's a Christian. And then he became you know, one of the greatest, what's called, apologists. He would beat down people now for not being Christian, get into arguments and all that kind of stuff. Okay? So, all that is preface to what we didn't talk about at all. Um, so, for Monday, I've got two minutes. The first chapter in Fellowship of the Ring is a long expected party. Why? Because the first chapter in The Hobbit is an unexpected party. Tolkien is linking the two right there. Right? And it's in the second, and we're not going to say anything else about the party, really. Bilbo throws a party because he's getting ready to leave. And in Hobbit fashion, when it's your birthday, you give presents out to other people. I always remind my kids of this on their birthdays. <laughs> I forget it on my own. Um, and so he invites a whole bunch of people, 144. Why? He's going to give out a whole bunch of presents because when he leaves, he's going to leave something. The ring that he got back in The Hobbit with Frodo. And he thinks it'll be easier to drop off this one thing when I have to give away all this other stuff. If you've never read it, I'm going to give it away. It's not easier. Even in the films, it shows that. Okay? So there's some tension there. And we'll talk about that, that very briefly on Tuesday. And then we're going to jump into the shadow of the past. And like I said, we'll probably spend most of the class period just on that one chapter. So we'll be way behind. All right? Uh, the rest of what's called book one, when Tolkien wrote these, it's actually six books. Book one, book two, make up Fellowship of the Ring. Books three and four make up the two towers. Books five and six make up uh, Return of the King. So we'll spend not a lot of time on the remainder of this. Um, who am I kidding? Yes, we will. We're just going to be way behind. All right. Have a good weekend. Sorry to be way behind. Like I said, the link to... Um, On Fairy Stories is on the website.